Today, let's explore why you can't stay poor if you truly understand this concept. Imagine you're in a vast universe filled with endless possibilities. You're here to tap into the abundance around you, but there's a secret to unlocking it. That secret is understanding how your mind and emotions shape your reality. First, let's talk about how your mind and emotions influence your financial situation. You see, our thoughts and feelings aren't just fleeting experiences. They have real power. They send out signals into the quantum field, a field full of potential waiting for you to tap into it. Think of your thoughts and emotions as the energy that shapes your reality. When you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion, you're creating a powerful signal, like a laser beam, that cuts through the noise and aligns with what you truly want. When you understand this, you realize that staying poor isn't a permanent state. It's a result of the energy you're emitting. If you constantly think and feel lack, that's the signal you're sending out. And guess what? That's what you'll attract. But here's the good news. You can change this. By changing your thoughts and emotions, you can change your financial reality. Imagine you're looking to improve your financial situation. This is a great first step, but to really make things happen, you need to start by setting a clear intention. Think of your intention as a specific goal or a clear picture of what you want to achieve. For example, maybe you want a new job, a promotion at work, or a successful business. It's not enough just to say, I want to improve my financial situation. You need to be specific. Picture exactly what you want. What kind of job do you want? What will the promotion look like? What does your successful business entail? The more details you can imagine, the stronger your intention becomes. This means thinking about every aspect of your goal. If it's a new job, think about the type of company, the role you want, and even the location. If it's a promotion, consider what responsibilities you'll have and what new skills you might need. If it's a business, picture what kind of products or services you will offer, who your customers will be, and what your workspace will look like. Now, just having a clear intention is a crucial step, but it's not enough on its own. To really make your intention powerful, you need to pair it with elevated emotions. These are positive feelings like joy, gratitude, and excitement. Think of these emotions as the energy that fuels your intention. Why are emotions so important? Emotions are like the energy that powers your goals. When you feel happy, grateful, or excited, you're sending out a strong signal to the universe about what you want. These feelings help to attract opportunities and positive changes into your life. For example, if you imagine your new job and you feel excited about it, you're sending out a positive energy that can help you move closer to that goal. If you feel grateful for the opportunities you already have, you're opening yourself up to more good things coming your way. And if you're joyful about the success you're aiming for, you're creating a strong, positive vibration that can draw that success toward you. So, how do you connect these positive emotions with your intentions? One way is through visualization. Close your eyes and imagine yourself achieving your goal. Picture every detail as vividly as possible. Feel the joy of landing that new job, the excitement of getting that promotion, or the satisfaction of running your successful business. Another technique is to use affirmations. These are positive statements that reinforce your goals and emotions. For example, you might say, I am thrilled about my new job and grateful for the opportunities it brings. Repeat these affirmations regularly to keep your emotions aligned with your intentions. You can also use gratitude exercises. Each day, write down a few things you are grateful for. This practice helps you focus on the positive aspects of your life, which can boost your overall emotional state and keep your energy high. Let's dive a little deeper into this. When you have a clear intention and feel positive emotions about it, you create a coherent energy signature. This coherent signature is like a magnet that draws your desires to you. But if your emotions are not aligned with your intention, you're sending mixed signals and your progress will be slow. You have to consistently align your thoughts and emotions with what you want. It's about creating a vibrational match 
between your energy and the potential in the quantum field. Now you might wonder how to keep your emotions elevated, especially when facing challenges. It's all about practice and awareness. When you start feeling frustration or doubt, recognize it and shift your focus back to your vision. Practice maintaining your elevated emotions even when things aren't going perfectly. This is where your true power lies. The more you practice, the easier it becomes to stay aligned with your intentions. Let's consider an example. Say you want to manifest financial abundance. Start by visualizing the details. Imagine your bank account growing, your investments thriving, or your business expanding. Feel the excitement and gratitude as if it's already happening. Write down your goals, create a vision board, or use affirmations. The key is to immerse yourself in the feelings of having already achieved your financial goals. But here's where it gets even more interesting. Your body follows your mind. When you consistently align your thoughts and emotions with your desired outcome, your body starts to adapt. Your mind and body begin to resonate with the energy of abundance. This resonance makes you more receptive to opportunities and ideas that can improve your financial situation. You might be asking yourself, how long will it take to see changes in my financial situation? That's a great question, and one that many people have when they start working on improving their lives. To help answer this, think about how a garden grows. When you plant seeds, you don't expect them to become full-grown plants overnight. It takes time. You need to water the garden, remove weeds, and make sure the plants get enough sunlight. It's a continuous process of care and attention. The same principle applies to changing your financial situation. When you start focusing on improving your finances, it's not a quick fix. It's more like growing a garden. You need to be patient and persistent. Just like the garden requires daily care, your financial progress needs regular nurturing. First, let's discuss the idea of nurturing. When you are working on improving your financial situation, think of it as planting seeds. Just like how you would plant seeds in a garden and then care for them, you need to plant and nurture your financial goals to see them grow and thrive. When you plant seeds, you have to start by choosing what you want to grow. This is similar to setting clear goals for your finances. For instance, you might want to save more money, invest wisely, or create new sources of income. These goals are like seeds that you need to plant in your financial garden. Next, after planting seeds, you need to make sure they have everything they need to grow. This means giving them water, sunlight, and proper soil. In financial terms, this means putting in effort and making thoughtful decisions to achieve your goals. For example, if your goal is to save more money, you might need to create a budget and stick to it. If you want to invest wisely, you may need to research different investment options and choose ones that fit your financial goals and risk tolerance. Nurturing your financial goals also involves regularly checking on them and making adjustments as needed. Just like you would check your garden to see if the plants need more water or if any weeds need to be removed, you should regularly review your financial plans. This could mean checking your budget to see if you are on track, revisiting your investments to ensure they are performing well, or finding new ways to increase your income. Another important part of nurturing is patience. Plants don't grow overnight, and neither do financial improvements. It takes time for seeds to grow into strong plants, and it takes time for your financial goals to come to fruition. You need to be patient and stay committed to your financial plan, even if you don't see immediate results. Consistency is key. In the garden, if you only water the plants once in a while, they might not grow well. Similarly, if you only work on your financial goals sporadically, you might not see the progress you want. Make a habit of regularly working on your goals and staying focused on your financial plan. Next, consider the need for consistent effort. In gardening, you don't water the plants just once and then forget about them. You need to water them regularly, sometimes even daily, to help them grow strong and healthy. In the same way, you need to consistently work on your financial goals. 
fact, this could involve regularly reviewing your budget, sticking to your savings plan, or continually learning about investing. Every small step you take adds up over time. Removing weeds is another important part of gardening. Weeds can compete with your plants for nutrients and sunlight, and if left unchecked, they can hinder your garden's growth. In your financial life, weeds can be negative habits, limiting beliefs, or unnecessary expenses. Identifying and addressing these obstacles is crucial for your financial growth. For example, you might need to overcome a habit of impulsive spending or change a belief that you don't deserve financial success. By tackling these issues, you create a healthier environment for your financial goals to thrive. Sunlight is essential for plants to grow. It provides the energy they need to convert nutrients into growth. Similarly, your financial progress needs positive energy and motivation. This comes from maintaining a positive mindset and reinforcing your intentions. Regularly remind yourself of your goals and celebrate your progress, no matter how small. This positive reinforcement acts like sunlight, helping to energize and sustain your financial growth. Over time, with consistent effort and care, you will start to see results. Just like a garden eventually produces flowers or fruit, your financial situation will begin to improve. The key is to remain patient and persistent. Understand that financial growth is a journey and it requires ongoing effort and dedication. Your progress may not be immediate, but with continued care, you will see your efforts start to bear fruit. Remember, the key is to stay patient and persistent. Don't let temporary setbacks make you doubt the process. Every challenge is an opportunity to strengthen your alignment with your goals. If you find yourself slipping back into old patterns of lack, gently bring yourself back to your vision and elevated emotions. This practice is essential for creating lasting change. It's important to understand how powerful your subconscious mind is. Your subconscious is like a deep, hidden part of your mind that stores all your beliefs, memories, and habits. Even if you're not aware of it, your subconscious mind plays a big role in how you think and feel about money and abundance. Often your subconscious holds on to old beliefs and patterns. For example, if you grew up hearing that money is hard to come by or that rich people are selfish, these beliefs might still be affecting you today. These old ideas can create a block that keeps you from reaching your financial goals. To change your financial situation, it's important to consciously reprogram your subconscious mind. This means actively working to replace those old beliefs with new, positive ones. You want to fill your mind with thoughts and emotions that support a mindset of abundance rather than scarcity. You see, staying poor is not a matter of fate. It's a result of the energy you're putting out. By understanding how your thoughts and emotions influence your reality, you can shift your energy to attract abundance. It's about creating a vibrational match between your desires and the energy you emit. If you understand and apply these principles, you can't stay poor. Your thoughts and emotions are powerful tools for shaping your financial reality. By setting clear intentions, maintaining elevated emotions, and consistently aligning your energy with your goals, you open the door to abundance. Remember, it's a journey, and every step you take towards maintaining positive thoughts and emotions brings you closer to your financial aspirations. So, apply it in your life and watch as your financial situation transforms. Your power to change your reality is within you. Love to feed off emotions and feed off energy. And I've seen those too because when a person finally gets beyond their suffering or whatever, they no longer can host on that person because they're no longer that emotion, that energy any longer. So then all of a sudden the person experiences a tremendous amount of freedom as well. And yeah, of course, now they're setting themselves up for something else. What I do know though, is that our intention really is to connect to the divine. Our intention is to become divine. Our intention is to open our hearts and trust again, to love again. Our intention is to teach our bodies emotionally 
what our future could feel like, to trade guilt and shame and resentment and jealousy and envy and competition for love. And we practice that in our week-long events. And once this center begins to open up, we're after coherence. So if you have a coherent heart and you're able to manage that and sustain the heart coherence, the field around your body begins to expand up to three meters wide. And that frequency, that coherent frequency, is like a Wi-Fi signal. You got a signal now. And at the same time, once energy makes it to the heart and it goes to the brain and you teach a person how to create a coherent brain and be able to suppress the mechanism of the thinking neocortex, the memory bank of the known self, teach a person how to operate from their limbic brain and tune that pineal gland into frequency and allow that pineal gland to lock into a frequency, now you have a Wi-Fi signal as well. And it can read information. And these beings, I was doing this event in Florida, in Amelia Island. It was an advanced event, advanced follow-up. And this is people that have done advanced workshops. And the event was called Dream Time, that were up from 11 at night till 8 in the morning for the mystical. And if you don't want to do the mystical, don't come. But I'm going to be messing with your sleep. And I stay up the entire night. I'm watching the entire audience. And we're keeping them between worlds, between wakefulness and sleep in that theta realm. And many people have very profound transcendental experiences while we're doing it. And I was trying to think of a way to explain this to the audience. And I had just finished the morning. I hadn't done my meditation. So I went into my room. I sat up. I did my meditation and then I laid down and when I laid down all of a sudden I see this beautiful fractal pattern with my eyes closed in the room and the moment I see that fractal pattern I know that that's order that's information a packet a standing wave of information and I sense it I see it with my eyes closed and then it unfolds like it rolls out on this beautiful being standing right next to me. And I'm sitting there with my eyes closed and I say, oh shit, like holy, like whoa. And I hear it laugh and it sounds like a symphony, like a harmony. In fifth dimensional creation, you are not going anywhere to get anything. Fifth dimensional creation has nothing to do with going anywhere to get anything. Because if you combine a clear intention, a coherent thought, coherent brainwave pattern with a coherent heart moving into that elevated emotion. Thoughts are electric and feelings are magnetic. The magnetism of this center becomes the energy. The intention is carried on that energy. And now you are broadcasting a new signature into the quantum field. Now, if it's done properly and you understand the mechanics in fifth dimensional creation, you are not going anywhere to get anything you are actually collapsing space and time and you are drawing the experience to you. You are the vortex because when there's a vibrational match between your energy and that potential that exists in the quantum field by tuning a radio dial, when you lock into that frequency, if you keep revisiting that energetic signature over again every single day, then you don't have to go anywhere and get it. The new job finds you. The new house actually finds you. The new relationship finds you because you are the vortex that's drawing the experience to you. My definition of creation is when I forget about me. I become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time. I become pure consciousness. And the moment I reach that elegant moment of the generous present moment, all possibilities in the quantum field exist truly when our brain and body are in the present moment. Getting there is the work. So then, most people then create reality from what we call three-dimensional creation. Now, when you teach people how to take their attention off of matter, off of objects, off of a particle, and sense energy and sense space and pay attention to nothing, the moment they begin to open their focus, all of a sudden, their brain waves begin to change from beta to alpha. But not only just alpha, where the imaginary inner world starts to become more real, but very coherent brainwave patterns in alpha. So when you're under stress, you're trying to control that person, that thing that you're experiencing, your attention is shifting from one thing to the next, 
Turns out that each one of those things has a neurological network in the brain assigned to it because we've experienced it. So as you try to control all these things and your attention is shifting, you measure the brain. There's no coherency. The brain is very incoherent. Why is it important to have coherency? Well, because the moment you open your focus and the brain begins to acclimate, different compartments of the brain begin to unify. They begin to synchronize. And what sinks in the brain links in the brain. So when your brain is coherent, you're coherent. When your brain is incoherent, you are incoherent. The person, the maverick, who's willing to step out into the unknown, that unknown is the perfect place to create from because only in the unknown can you create something new. And if you and I can become comfortable in that unknown place, then the best way to predict the future is to create it from that unknown place. Now, when people start crossing the river of change from the old self to the new self, because they're no longer thinking, acting, and feeling in the same way, there is literally a biological, a neurological, a genetic, a chemical death of the old self. And this dark night of the soul, this unfamiliar place, is the true value, the true step towards developing a new self. So then if we're leaving the old and we are creating the new, then the next most important question is, well, if I'm going to create a new self, what thoughts do I want to think? What behaviors can I plan? And as you begin to image and rehearse a new way of being, you are changing your brain and body neurologically and biologically. That's the neuroscientific model of mental rehearsal. Most of our thoughts and feelings come from our past experiences. They come from our memories. In fact, your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of all the things you've learned and experienced to date. It's an artifact. And when you have an experience, when you're in the midst of an experience, all of your five senses plug you into the external environment. And as your brain is processing all of this vital sensory data, all of that information rushes back to the brain. And when it reaches the brain, it causes jungles of neurons to organize themselves into networks, to string into patterns, to reflect their interaction with their external environment. The moment those neurons organize into patterns, the brain makes a chemical, and that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. And so experiences tend to create more long-term memories because it patterns or stamps or embosses networks of neurons into very specific patterns. And then the emotional quotient helps us to remember the event. So we learn something new intellectually. We also cause networks of neurons to form. I mean, the Nobel Prize laureate Candle in the year 2000 found that when people learn just one bit of information, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 300 connections to 2,600 connections. So if they didn't review that information or repeat it, the connections pruned apart. So we know then that learning semantic information begins to organize circuitry in the brain and experiences enrich the brain. The end product of experience, of course, is the emotion and it causes us to feel certain ways. You can remember where you were on 9-11. You can tell me who you were with, what time of day it was, what you were doing, because whatever you were seeing in that moment or hearing in that moment changed how you were feeling. And the moment you felt altered or you felt differently, significantly, your brain perked up and you paid attention to whatever caused that. And that event in and of itself is called a memory. So then most of our thoughts and feelings tend to be within the neural circuitry of the past and the emotions of the past chemically. So if you take a thought, thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body and how you think and how you feel creates a state of being. So if you combine a thought and a feeling, a thought and a feeling, a thought and a feeling, and you have a series of good thoughts that are connected to a series of good feelings, that cycle of thinking and feeling creates what's called an attitude. If you have a series of negative thoughts that are connected to some pretty bad feelings, you'll say you have a pretty bad attitude today. So if how you think and how you feel creates a state of being, your attitudes are just shortened states of being. 
you feel good in the morning, you feel bad in the afternoon. If you take an attitude, an attitude, an attitude, and you begin to string attitudes together, when you combine an attitude, an attitude, an attitude, you start to form what's called beliefs. Now, a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over and over again until you hardwire it in your brain. And because beliefs are based on past experiences, the very boundaries of our beliefs are how we feel. And so when our beliefs get challenged, it typically doesn't feel right. I know from the research that we've done that the redundancy of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking over time, for example, a person has an insecure thought, then they feel insecure. The moment they feel insecure, they think more insecure thoughts. They fire and wire more circuits in their brain to feel more chemicals of insecurity. And then once they're feeling insecure, they think more insecure thoughts. And they do this over and over again. The redundancy and the repetition of that cycle over time conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind. Once the body becomes the mind, that's called a habit. It turns out that 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old are a set of habituations, unconscious thoughts, unconscious behaviors, unconscious emotional reactions that function like a subconscious computer program. So back to beliefs. An attitude, an attitude, an attitude are shortened states of being, and you combine them together then. Then a belief, then the cycle of thinking and feeling over time creates a subconscious state of being. I don't move past the word visualization because I think it kind of conjures up a little bit too much of a spiritual association. The word that's used in science is called mental rehearsal. In mental rehearsal, there's two types of mental rehearsal. There's what's called internal mental imaging, which means you're in the scene as the first person experiencing it. And then there's called external mental imaging, which is you're observing yourself in the scene. It turns out that when you are actually in the first person and not the third person, that action of rehearsing what you're doing produces the strong biological change. Now let's talk about this. You can take a group of people that have never played the piano before, and you can do a functional brain scan on them, and then you can teach them one-handed scales and chords, and they'll practice those chords two hours a day for five days. At the end of five days, they grow a whole new set of circuits on the opposite side of the brain. Well, that makes sense. You learn something new. Learning is making new synaptic connections. You get your body involved with some instruction. When you get your body involved, you're going to have a new experience. Experience enriches the brain. You pay attention to what you're doing. You've got to pay attention. You have to stay present. And if you repeat it over and over again, firing and wiring, firing and wiring, you assemble new networks of neurons equal to your experience. Nothing new there, but you can take a group of people and you can have them close their eyes to a brain scan on them before the experiment. Five days later, do a brain scan after. And for two hours a day, they mentally rehearse playing those scales and chords. At the end of five days, they grow the same amount of circuits in their brain as the people actually physically doing the exercise. So what's the relevance? Number one, when you're truly focused and you're truly paying attention, your brain does not know the difference between what's going on out there and what's going on in here. So the thought becomes the experience and the brain looks like it's been playing the piano for the last five days, but they never lifted a finger. Now from a biological standpoint, our brains are a record of the past. They're an artifact of everything we've learned and experienced to this moment. When we prime the brain to change its circuitry before the experience, now the brain is no longer a record of the past. It's now a map to the future. And so as we warm up those brain circuits, it's more easy for us to slip into a supernatural behavior. If you take those people and you set them from the piano, and they've never played the piano before, but they've been mentally rehearsing for the last five days, they'll play those scales and chords. Like magic, they just learned how to do it just by changing their internal state. 
take a group of men, you can have them close their eyes, and for an hour a day mentally rehearse doing bicep curls over and over again, and they add an emotional component called harder, stronger, more intense, and they put themselves in that first person internal mental image. At the end of two weeks, they have a 13.5 increase in muscle strength, and they've never performed the activity. Not only is the brain changed to look like the experience has already occurred, now the body has changed by thought alone. The body looks like it's been working out for the last two weeks, so then the power of mental rehearsal, of imaging, primes the brain and body to look like the future has already occurred. And when you set the extent of your limit, and you can image what you can do even further than what's normal, then you are stepping into the unknown, and of course then your body is going to follow your mind because the experience has already happened. You know, the challenge behind all of this is that people have to understand that there is a journey that they have to take. In other words, 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a set of memorized behaviors, emotional reactions, beliefs, perceptions, attitudes, behaviors that function like a subconscious computer program. 95% of who we are is a habit, and it's programmed in the body to keep doing something so many times, the body knows now how to do it better than your brain. So if that's 95% of who we are, the body becomes the mind, and most of the time, people are unconscious.